he was like, what's the future of advertising? Look, I think it, 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 it's going to, it is going to be true that it's going to be a lot of salad out there. So there's going to be a whole lot of salad. And there's some like some sort of like top layer, which is going to be very original and very uh, different. But there's lots of content going to look exactly the same. I think that was already a trend uh, due to like Pinterest boarding, mood boarding, stuff like that. It is already quite um, social, also uh, made more like cohesive trends and cohesive image, image trends and visual trends. Um, I think that that is going to be even more uh, valid and I think only like the top creators are able to step out of that um, like that general ge uh, general um, uh, look and feel that the, the image generators or the video generators will create that's going to be the valuable real valuable skill so i think the big brands are going to invest heavily in people who are able to have like another kind of aesthetic so the ones who are able to create uh, a, a personal aesthetic or something very unique this is going to be super valuable in AI, for ai creators all right welcome to one more episode of zero one cast Today we had with us uh, Chrissy Kremers from Amsterdam. So she opened like the first really focused AI agency in the Netherlands. And yeah, we had a great talk about yeah, AI, AI use on the advertisement creative industry, AI creativity, ethics, and, and many more. So what do you think, Mauricio? How was the conversation for you? Yeah, hello everyone. So Chrissy and I have been exchanging content and, and, and uh, having conversations about, about AI and filmmaking for a long time. So it was an absolute pleasure to have her on this conversation. I love how organic we went and talked a lot, a lot about different stuff we didn't even plan, like uh, AI devices and pins and this kind of things and how important the community and the creativity aspect of humans is the still the most important things that we can bring to the AI landscape. So, yeah, love the conversation. Hope you all do too. All right, so let's go to the episode. Hello, welcome to one more episode of Zero One Cast, a place that humans create in machines. And today we have with us uh, Chrissy from the AI agency of Amsterdam. And so Chris is exploring, so AI applied to advertisement, film, video. Uh, she, I think, is the first agency together with her partner in Amsterdam to be focusing on that. And yeah, we want to talk about many things. Uh, of course, ethical side of AI, diversity, uh, advertisement, change on the market, jobs, and, and many more. So yeah, Chris, thanks for coming. Thanks for finding some time to talk to us. It's always good to have more deeper conversations about AI, and yeah, it's not with everyone we can talk about it. So yeah, maybe you can start giving some short in introduction about yourself, uh, then we can start talking about AI. Yes, thanks for having me. I'm super excited uh, that I could uh, join your podcast. Um, I think I yeah, well, I've been familiar with you for a little while now, and. Uh, I've also sh uh, seen your other podcast and uh, really enjoying it. So thanks for having me. Uh, let me introduce myself a bit. So I'm Chrissy Kramers, Chrissy Kramers in English from Agency Amsterdam. And we're um, yeah, an agency focused on 100% AI production. So we try to solve, um, really um, crack the code with AI and AI tooling when it comes to commercial productions. So we're doing commercials, cinematography uh, for brands. Um, we work directly for brands and we work for larger agencies in, in the Netherlands, uh, but they're mostly global brands and global agencies as well. So um, we've started in September. I'm doing this with uh, my partner, Karina, Karina Snipper. We started this in September, and uh, well, as everything in the, the AI business, uh, things are going super fast. So um, we're very lucky to have been 
probably the first in the Netherlands to, to launch this, um, maybe even the first in the west, western side of the EU. Um, I wouldn't know it globally, but that, that's what I sort of know. And, and that, that really helped. So that's kind of uh, got us into a place where we are well, seriously being considered as an agency and uh, there's lots of demand from brands and they want to uh, yeah, collaborate with, um, with uh, like a party who has like multiple contacts. So that, that's, that's what I think is part of the, the growth and, uh, and the success so far. And, uh, and well, it's, it's super exciting. But um, just to be clear, I started AI creation because I really love it, like you both also do. And because I was just so intrigued by the technology and one thing led to the other. I was never ever planning to start an agency, let alone with my business partner who is also my life partner, which is obviously an awful decision. But here we are. This is my life and uh, I'm loving it so far. It's going really well. So that's it. Right. Th thanks for, for sharing. Uh, yeah, today I also have with me, Mauricio, my co-host. So usually we start with a question. I do the same question for everyone, which is before we talk about AI, uh, how was your life before AI? So we know that AI is transforming uh, many lives and many markets and many things. So how, how was your work routine in your creative process like before AI and how it has changed now after AI? So I was, uh, have been an art director and creative director focusing on brand design and um, brand creation for sustainable brands. So I have actually always worked at the client side. And Karina has always worked at, uh, at agencies, at the advertising side. So um, on the advertising business uh, at, the at the agency side. So we were kind of on from the from opposite sides. We we worked, and I was um, mostly doing brand identity design, and also have been trained as a phot photography art director. So with a visual for visual assets, also done a bit of videography um, and a little bit of video, but mostly static imagery uh, as an art director. And um, yeah, what AI kind of changed for me is that I was all always very interested and um, I guess also very focused on making photography out output but I was never able to create photography outputs uh, as uh, a designer so I needed like a photographer whom I really respect by the way and we always had to have a team and a production and it was all well a lot of hassle and I did it a lot I did a lot of photo productions I did a lot of shoots in my life but this allowed me to create my visual um, direction directly and that was that was such a game changer so it, it cut out like a whole part of the, the creation process and it allows now uh, me to now be a cinematographer while I could have never been a photographer interesting thank thanks for sharing and for 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 you do you think AI uh, boosts creativity? Do you think it doesn't make any difference? Or do you think it like, what's, what's your, your thoughts about the AI and creativity in general? AI is, is um, a tool and I still think, I, I have always been like really into creation, cre the creation of something new. I think the change for me is that AI is a product, productivity booster so there's more output now and uh, that that's that's kind of exciting and it also makes me more have more creative energy more creative flow so I guess it does it is an amplifier of creativity and it is um, yeah it's a leverager of uh, creativity so I think the level of create creative output and the uh, the number of productions I can do now is, is all higher because of AI. Yeah, 100%. Uh, hi, Chrissy. Happy to have you here. Uh, We've been having conversations and, and sharing some things from some time, so super happy to have you here. I'm 100% I'm with you. I think it's an enabler, right? Almost like a, 
something that, that shares creativity to the whole world. Like, I, I've met stories of people that, you know, lose their ability to do their art because of, you know, life accidents and things like that and being taken by using AI. So it's, I think it's so beautiful. Um, you are one of the pioneers in the AI agency business. Uh, tell us what inspired you to do that and how kind of the process was to get in that, in that situation. Like what, what really drive the fire behind the AI agency? Yeah, so um, we, uh, I worked at a startup last year. Um, it's a sustainable department store. That startup didn't make it. So I was at one point uh, about a year ago uh, without uh, like a job. So I was like, what, are, what am I going to do? Then I started freelancing. And I happened to have a collaborative job with Karina. So she hired me for, for a job, brand identity job. And in a brand identity, we needed uh, pictures, pictures of people, portraits. The brand had like an image library, which wasn't very usable for the purpose I had in mind. Um, stock photography wasn't it either. It wasn't, it was pretty specific what I needed and I couldn't really find it in stock. So um, then I thought, well, I've been doing mid journey now for, well, I guess it was almost a year. Uh, but at that point, and I was like, okay, let's let me try and make them with Mid Journey. It was just a, it was a kind of a coincidence. So I was like, okay, let's create them with Mid Journey. Then have, we presented it to the client, and the client was, um, I wasn't there, so the, this was done by the agency. But um, so the client was asking things like, okay, this is interesting. So what happens if we want to? Um, have these uh, pictures? What, what, what if we want to use them for our campaign? And well, we were like, okay, yes, uh, this is possible. And they were like, okay, do we, uh, what about portrait rights? Well, do you, there's no need because the, these are not actual people. And what about licensing? Well, we cannot really license the photography because it's AI created and we don't own uh, the AI photography either, so the cinematography is not ours either. Um, and there, and they also asked, well, production time, and we're like, okay, it can be finished tomorrow. Can you upscale it? Yes, sure, we can upscale it. Well, I had to look that up, definitely at that time, but um, it was possible, and now it's much better than it than it was then. But it was already possible. Um, so it was like, I I think we like had like four or five USPs, unique selling points of AI photography. And, and we were like, damn, this is such a game changer. And especially if you've been on the client side, you know how difficult it is to have your limited budgets, but have all the output needed. And you are confined to stock imagery or something you don't really want or things you have to reuse stuff and definitely for somebody being a creative director the role that i had is quite frustrating so this was such a game-changing solution and also from the agency side we're like okay we can now produce much more much faster and it's uh, it looks the output level can be so much better than before because of the the budgets we previously had we couldn't produce the same types of output so it's that was i mean that that goes especially for the mid level brands i guess um um but still i think for all it's it's a uh, it's a win win for all kinds of brands and um well that that led to us uh Karina and i discussing that this was such uh, you know, a disruptive element within the photography business. And then over the, over the summer, so summer of 2023, we started thinking about Agency Amsterdam and we built the proposition and the site, everything. And then we, we started in September. And after that, we, we uh, quickly decided that we needed to have AI video too. I guess we what we do is we look at is the technology there. So for photography, for AI photography, it was definitely there. Uh, for video, it took a little bit longer. So I think we're now some sort of in that phase where it's nearly 
ready, almost perfect. So we're now in that phase where we can, you know, use it commercially or at least starting to use it commercially. Um, and that's what that's why we decided, like it was one and a half months or two months ago, that we decided to also introduce our video services and then also rebranch because if you have video you also need sonic solutions so that's when we introduced ai sonic solutions as well and that's now we were building all these services that people ask us to build so also character design um yeah lots of pipeline design engineering all this this stuff so this is actually what we're we're now building and and, and branching out to um, so we want to be a full-service AI production agency. This is what we're going for. Wow, that's amazing. It's super interesting that you, you basically have a proof of concept of the agency before starting the agency in a real project with a real brand, a real client, a real budget. Like That's incredible. It's an opportunity to really, really... that positioning you in a really specific and, and interesting place. Like That's awesome. Uh, still on the agency team, what do you say are the main challenges you face being an AI agency compared to a normal agency? And which are the most complicated requests you receive it from clients until now? Or even something that you find like was completely absurd or funny thing to comment? Well, the, the, the general issue, what, 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 um, what we, that we have or the things that are difficult is that when clients expect AI productions to be on the level of VFX or CGI or film. So it's another tool and it's another type workflow and it's another output. The output is different and especially because it's also a development, a tool in development. So it's not, it's not fully on the level of um, of film and it's it's not as controllable as uh, VFX or CGI is. So I think there's lots of high expectations and pe people see all these amazing uh, trailers or short films coming along. Um, and I think uh, you you are also the ones to blame, Oder and Mauricio, for that because it's because of your uh, videos that they're watching, like your nice films and movies that you're making, that they're like, oh, is this already possible? But it's super, a diff it's a different, um, it's a different purpose, right? So uh, making. Um, a fancy film trailer or something that you have in your mind is different than uh, okay I have this product and it needs to be we need to have a commercial surrounding this product we have a model this model should look the same in scene one till scene five and it's sh it cannot change like not at all and this is all the consistency and the controllability is the most that's the the most challenging part of AI so I guess th that's also our challenge um, and we're working with great people and great talents, uh, but for us also, even though we have the maximum control on the tools and the maximum uh, consistency that's, that's achievable, it's still um, a challenge. So that it's, we're not, that's, I guess that those are the issues and also the issue for us as an agency is where to get the talents because these are the, I guess the people who are able to deliver on the level that we are looking for, they are not uh, widely spread, right? These are, these, are, these are rare because these are people who have embraced AI fully since it was introduced, which is not that long ago and they have had had to be in a position where they could do that, either either because they were already a creative or because they had to learn some new trades. But in any way, they have to be in fully, had to be fully invested in AI since, well, at least since the summer of 2022. So um, finding the right people, uh, this is why we work very internationally with people from all over the world, which is also very fun. But we're a virtual production agency and we also have a virtual team. Right, got it. But uh, yeah, but that, that's interesting anyways. And I think many agencies, even traditional agencies, will look for this kind of professionals. And more and more, I'm also seeing job offers, job posts on LinkedIn slowly, like for like traditional agencies that we know <clears throat> very well, looking for AI creative director or AI designer or creator of video images. So I, I'm also seeing this 
this trend uh, on the job market. So <clears throat> let's talk that's a actually, bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, go for it. No, that's actually a good point that you're raising because, okay, how how um, what's the difference going to be right between a traditional agency who's going to invest in AI and an AI production agency like ours, a creative AI production agency like ours. But I think that um, AI, as, as we view it, like AI is another tool in the toolbox. So you have animation, you have CGI, you have film, you have photography, everything. And um, AI is a real specialty in itself. And if you don't know the trade, if you don't know like the real detailing and you don't have the right you don't have the right vision of how to combine like people, teams, workflows, pipelines, um, then you're, you're not using AI to its fullest level. Uh, and I guess that's where a specialized AI agency, not only us, but all that are specialized in AI production are much more valuable in that sense and, and can reach further and higher and more qualitative outputs than the ones that are uh, also invested in the traditional ways. The, also, the issue is with if you're already very familiar with the traditional ways, it's very easy to think of, oh, this is not doable with AI, then mm, let's do it with VFX or let's film it or, and then this, in the, in the end, this will, uh, um, uh, what happens if you do that is that uh, while we are trying to invest in advancing AI workflows, um, you'll fall back on the traditional ways and then it's it's going to be very hard to uh, keep up with the advancements in AI because it's already going so fast and it's very hard to keep up for traditional agencies, uh, especially and especially when they're a bit bigger. So that's, that's the challenge for the traditional agency market um, trying to uh, work around their workflows to AI workflows. Yeah, that <clears throat> similar challenge for big uh, film studios, production studios as well, which are so slow and big, and it's hard to, uh, and these things move so fast. Uh, yeah, it's uh, crazy, definitely. I would like to talk a bit about uh, also diversity, and uh, I think AI models are, are biased, right? Uh, I think that's a fact. They reflect our bias because we train them with our ba biased data. So. How, how to tackle this uh, diversity aspect of AI or what, what's your take on it and do you see any form of mitigate this and yeah, what's your, what's your take on that? Well, I think the awareness is, is the start. So I think you have to be aware uh, and also uh, teach your clients and make sure that everybody knows that these tools can be very biased. So. Um, as long as you know it, then you can counteract on it. And um, I think what's really, really important is that people will, um, we're, we're very heavy, heavily invested in ethical AI. So for us, this is a very important topic. I guess uh, there's, there's much proof of concept there. You, you guys know me and you know, you know that that's true. But um, so what, what's the, um, uh, the, the most important important part of uh, being trying to stay diverse and inclusive in AI output is that you have to introduce a wider spectrum when it comes when it, when you're creating. So you have to be aware that um, you're now like if you're not uh, if you're not uh, consciously counteracting the bias, you're you're going to produce the, this output while society or like human uh, society is like very wide. So you have to be sure that you, you are able uh, to capture all these uh, facets of human diversity. The issue is a bit that in the real life you have people, for instance, without, with only one arm or people with um, four fingers. Th these are things that are going to be um, this is pe what people like see as a, a faulty generation, right? This is what we perceive as a faulty generation. So it'll be hard to keep that kind of diversity in, in, in the tooling and also in the knowledge of the tooling. Um, so yeah, there, there's definitely real struggles there. And I think it's, that's why it's also very important 
I guess this is very important to say that this, this is also the reason why real photography and real film and is so super important to keep that uh, diversity going because it would be very, very bad for the, the final, like within 10 years and the output will, will be seeing and the content will be seeing if there's only going to be AI creators from now on. Yeah, that definitely, uh, definitely a good point. But I think that's also something that people outside the bubble uh, misunderstand a lot, that uh, it's not because we do AI film or AI images now, because we are capable of, means that we want to live in a world where all the movies are AI and all the images are created by AI. No, we don't. I don't want to live in this world where there is no museums and analog photography and, and whatever, which is human made, right? So it's not, it's not here to replace anything, it's just here as a new way to create, a new way to express, and yeah, and as we said, it also impacts the production costs and money, so there's no doubt of it that this wave will come, and I think, yeah, as soon as you build the boat, the best. And talking about, yeah, also still the artists and clients, so uh, are clients still afraid to use AI, and what are the main barriers or main excuses or motivations from clients and how do you see also this AI transforming the, the, the advertising landscape? So two, two questions, how clients are reacting and what they are mostly afraid of, and how do you see this change also in transforming the advertisement AI? Well, they, they are afraid of the copyright issues. Uh, there are two, like there are two issues there. So you have, um, they don't own the final uh, image or the final video, they might own a bit. There's a layer of copyright on it. There's like a thin layer of copyright on it, uh, but the base is not is not copyright copyrightable at the moment. So this is especially for the larger corporate brands uh, is can be a real issue. Um, it's it's it, there's also not an easy solution. What we do notice is that in the end they'll choose. Um, the flexibility, the efficiency, the post-production options over that copyright issue. And I guess it's also very valid to look at uh, copyright litigation as something that needs to change because we're, 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 in this, we're, we're in this era where there's so much content produced. Do you really need to own that content for the, for the the upcoming decade, right? Do you, this, this is an age where every day is the, there's new content coming, and every day is a new, is especially when it comes to social content, um, it's forgotten tomorrow, or it's it's at least forgotten within a month. So, is it, can can we not develop like a new view on what is content? How how important is it to own something? Is it? I think also with uh, we're all for open source here. I think. We, all three of us are for open source. I guess the content issue should also be op more open source. I think people should not be so restricted to owning something. Also because, especially for brands, it's very valuable when something goes viral or something is shared or something is used, reused, remade. Is it a problem? I don't think so. I, I think there's, there's, there, there needs to be a new like vision on that because it, the, the world has changed and the, and the market has changed a lot concerning yeah, that. I think so we need to create a new label because my, my, what I see, and maybe I'm totally wrong, but is that the copyright is dissolving in some way. Because also, like for example, now there was this news that uh, Adobe used image from mid-journey to train their own AI. So, like, so then, because then you have this, you know, this, this drawing of the snake eating the snake, the, the whole of the snake of this eternal, but like, you know, it's like AI training, so you generate content with AI that we use to train AI, that we generate more content that we use to train AI. So when you start to do this with images and videos, everything starts to blend and you don't know anymore. Like, it's a, like maybe we'll trace five batches before this was a real video, but then it mixed with AI video and now it's something else. It's like this salad. And yeah, I think we are starting to reach this point where, so things will not be traceable anymore because everything, and everything comes from somewhere anyways, but we are kind of like, when we start to use more and more data created by AI to train AI, we start to blend everything, right? 
Well, that's that's also a valid concern, considering your your second question. You was like, what's the future of advertising? Look, I think it it, it it's going to it is going to be true that it's going to be a lot of salad out there. So there's going to be a whole lot of salad. And there's some like some sort of like top layer which is going to be very original and very uh, different. But there's lots of content going to look exactly the same. I think that was already a trend uh, due to like Pinterest boarding, mood boarding, stuff like that. It is already quite um, social. Also, uh, made more like cohesive trends and cohesive image image trends and visual trends. Um, I think that that is going to be even more uh, valid, and I think only like the top creators are able to step out of that, um, like that general ge uh, general um, uh, look and feel that the, the image generators or the video generators will create. That's going to be the valuable, real valuable skill. So I think the big brands are going to invest heavily in people who are able to have like another kind of aesthetic. So the ones who are able to create uh, a, a personal aesthetic or something very unique, this is going to be super valuable in AI, for AI creators, creation. Yeah, I, I also agree with you. Like, even from, from some years ago, like a lot of artists complain, yeah, yeah, I was still my job, and then you see the artist profile, he, all that he knew what to do was to operate a software. He literally took a photo, or an existing photo, and transformed it into a 3D, and he used the exact same pose, exact, like he didn't even bring anything new to the game. He just changed from one media to another, and like, ah, he was still my job. And yeah, if you're just operating a software, probably will, you know, because where's the idea, where's the concept, where's it? Where's the human part that you're bringing to the whole thing, you know? I think that's, that's the most important thing that we need to remember, that creativity is a human trace that is really hard to replicate, like, because we don't understand it <laughs> ourselves. That's true. We, we that's know true. it's there, we know it works, but... Yeah, that's true. I agree. And I think also that I think now AI creators or AI professionals are coming out of that phase while, while, where everybody was impressed by anything, right? So everybody was, I mean, that was logical because it was all new and we're like, oh, she can create that? Like that marketing executive or that accountant could suddenly like create that? And that was impressive. I mean, uh, that, that, that was an honest uh, reaction. But now I think we're at the stage where we'll, we'll, we're seeing who's going to be like the professionals in this field and who loves to do it as a hobby, which is also fine. And also very, I support that. And I, I love the democratization of uh, democratizing, I don't know how to pronounce this, <laughs> but of AI creation. Um, that's, that's, that's wonderful and I love that. But uh, for us as an agency, we need professionals, right? We also need to be working with uh, people who can the most difficult part for us is that we always get a brief right as an agency and the brief is going to be super narrow mm -hmm. and then what we want is somebody who can end up here within the brief this is the hardest part most people end up here end up here and they're already good right these, these are good creators yeah like random people they just or amateurs they end up like everywhere but not like nowhere near but ending up in that in that sweet spot where you need them to be this is a, the hardest part and it's much harder for ai create creators than any other trade much harder than it is with photography it's much harder than it is with illustration or anything else um, because of the tooling is so has its own will it has its own mind it's it's so it's sort of yeah it's sort of this extra creator that you're bringing on board is it was like eh, i'm gonna do my own thing no you have to no ai too you have yeah. to do what i'm saying yeah. some days you prompt, some days <laughs> i prompt like and it's really day. bad some days it's really bad it's like photoshop some days it's really good <laughs> and like also sometimes i feel that mid journey has his own mood as well it doesn't work i always the same it has. it's like very yeah. temperamental like printer kind of <laughs> yeah it's it yeah and I also had some friends that were just like looking from outside and start to play with Mid Journey, and then they told me, "Yeah, I thought it was easier. It's not so easy as I expect to get what I want and what I need." And I say, "Yeah, it's like prompt engineering. You need to know how to prompt, but it's not 
just know how to prompt. It's like you need to speak the language of the mid journey. He has his own language, his own stuff. And more you use it, more you, you know how it thinks, how it works. And every update, he kind of changed the way he thinks in some way. And it's this constant yeah. like conversation with the machine, I think. Yes, it's, it's definitely true. It's, it's like we're working with a moody prince, right? And sometimes <laughs> it works with you and sometimes it doesn't. But yeah. I think the, 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 what I'm noticing is that the issue is that lots of people dismiss like AI tools like Midjourney uh, really fast because they are like, uh, it, it's not controllable or it's like, why would you use it's not controllable or you can't, uh, it's, it's not as controllable as uh, uh, stable diffusion or whatever. Like I'm now talking about mid journey. Well, I'm saying no. It's it's because you cannot control. It doesn't mean it's not controllable, yeah. right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, for me, stable diffusion is not very controllable. It just spits out something I don't want. But Mauricio is really good with stable diffusion. He spits out exactly what he wants. It's because he knows the tools, and I know mid journey. Exactly. You know stable diffusion. You know we all have our trade. Um, and our specialty in that. Um, but yeah, that's it's too bad to dismiss it. I wouldn't dismiss it. I, I would not advise uh, to dismiss it if you are a creator. Yeah, 100%. I think we should try everything and see what fits for us. Like it's like even in, in photography, like we have different cameras, different films, different techniques and 3D, you have different software. It's the same, you know. It is super different in some ways, but in, in the end, in all, a lot of ways, it's still the same, you know, it's another tool for us to use. And, and, and what you say got me thinking under something quite interesting that is a lot of the industry, like the media and advertising, especially the advertising industry, a lot of things we do and the rules we create for brands and everything, we kind of create for ourselves, you know, like the audience doesn't even have the trained eye to spot the things that we like push to be necessary in some parts of the the the, the, the things they're seeing the product they're seeing so uh i'm thinking like is really that extreme level of consistency that necessary for brands anymore you know like these are the type of things we need to rethink like uh, I don't, that's everything. a good question <laughs> No, that's definitely a good question because the question is, do you want to use AI tooling as in the way that we were using film and photography or do you want to use AI tooling in its, you know, in its best field and it, in its that's power? That's a deeper like, question. Can like use to replicate the old ways, use the new to replicate the old ways of doing it. Yeah. That's one way. That's usually the first way to use it. But then we always look for this yeah. uh, twist. Yeah, same happened with photography, you know, like every painter gets care because what they did was portraits of people and then have a camera doing it. Then they start painting other things that were not portraits of people. And then um, like not really any new media, new styles was born from there. Like this is incredible, interesting too. I think it's, it's mainly because it's uh, the, the the reason why people are now trying to replicate like the traditional media, how well, sorry for everyone who's suddenly traditional, but let's call it the traditional media is is because I think you want to know to what extent is AI capable of being a, a traditional tool or a, a, like supplementing or a, a, um, like, uh, um, what do you call that? Like, uh, instead of like the traditional tools, like use it instead of the traditional tools, um, replacing, this was the very easy word I was like. So replacing the traditional tools, um, is, um, is it capable of doing that? And as if you know how far you can stretch that, then you, if you have that, uh, like that, that setup, if you have that framework, then mm -hmm. at least you know when not to use it. And yeah. when not to advise it. So it's, it's also, uh, I think that's also um, maybe a, a tip to all AI creators out there. Be okay with saying no. If somebody's asking for you to do something which is completely impossible <laughs> with AI, then be, be frank about it and say, okay, this is not for AI. If you want this, you either use another tool or you have to rethink your concept and do it in another way because AI is not the tool for this. It's like they are constantly at this point, they're constantly asking us, I'm sure you will have the same uh, experience, but they're constantly asking us 
um, suppose we are painters to constantly ask us to make 3D objects or be in a, a 3D sculptor. Well, mm -hmm. I'm a painter. Don't ask me to 3D <laughs> sculpt. But they're constantly asking that because they have no clue. Most people have no clue what are these tools capable of, right, mm -hmm. at this point. And I also, that this was also very interesting is that people who are like against AI or not very much invested in AI are have a very different view on what's like impressive within AI creation that than we have as um, people who know who know what AI is capable of but especially mm -hmm. what it is not capable of so some things that might look very uh, um, unimpressive to other people are very impressive to us because we know how hard it is to create certain like for instance consistency or uh, that it's not flickering right that high quality um, that somebody is like turning around and there's no morphing going on I mean if it's not morphing it's already very impressive right within yeah. AI creation at this point in time mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that there's a lot of critique coming from people who are like not invested in AI or not interested in AI saying, well, pff, why are you shouting so hard that this is so impressive? You can do this easily with film or you can do this so easy with VFX. <laughs> yeah, I understand that you can do it easily with VFX, but we're now trying to figure out where is AI going to take us and we need to take the full plunge and see where it's taking us. Uh, and see how it will develop along the way. Um, and you cannot compare it apples with pears, you know? Mm -hmm. They're constantly comparing apples with pears here. Yeah, people who look from outside. I received some comments on the, my Green Hacker film on YouTube, and I was trying to be respectful and discussing there with the guy. But he was saying, like, this is, you know, classic, but this is just a slideshow. Like, why you took yeah. such, a, uh, such a nice story and made this? Like, this is, like, so poor. You could do something much nicer using like Blender and After Effects and like, and then I was trying sure, to explain gaining, him that uh, <laughs> that like first I will never be able to do this in the old ways. This movie will never exist. It will just be uh, my computer like on Word like it was the story for four years. It will be there because I will never be able to do all this in 3D and After Effects and texturing and lightning and camera and rendering and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So. And I was just trying to, to explain that this is like a neighbor. Like, I know that's not perfect. I know it could be much better, but for we have now, I think it's already... And my, my main point is that AI enabled the story to come back to life. And without this, like when we did, I did this project on the beginning four years ago, our idea was to make some 2D animation, like uh, more like Japanese style, like Akira or something like that, with this team of the Green Hackers. And like to make like a two or three minutes to the animation was like super expensive and like will take like months or something like that, you know, to do all the process, storyboarding and approvals and then animation. So like it's, and I think that's something that people don't understand how, how this is just like a neighbor and we know that it's still not perfect, but we know that how fast this will go and yeah. But it's basically a tool to bring things to life. You don't need to be exactly right. like cinema and perfect. And, and, and also, I think what people forget is that now, like, the the max seconds you can get out of an AI animation is, like, four, maybe six, if you're really lucky, right? And then um, it's, like, the standard is four seconds, so people who are don't know, like, the limitations of that are not, like, aware that that's why we have all this stroboscoping editing right now going on, or, like, fast editing, or, like, yeah slideshow kind of editing um, because of these limitations but this will not mean that within a year from now we will still be doing that it's just it this is just the start and if you the thing is if because the the thing is, is that why we are so heavily invested in AI is because we really believe in its its capabilities in the future it's not because we are so impressed by its capabilities now it's because we know the trajectory that it's going and it's going like that and if we end this is where we'll end up is it out of the camera well it's <laughs> going to be far up there um 
Yeah, the, what we have today to is the worst we're gonna get, and it's already amazing. Right, and <laughs> it's gonna be amazing, and then and then it, it it is going to be able to create minutes or maybe you know it's going to be be a full uh, uh, picture movie of 90 minutes of great footage and this is going to come but it's it's not there yet but it's going to happen at one point yeah. another advice i give which i'm also doing so it's like if you know how to operate these tools already very well you're a designer you're a motion graphic you're an artist you're a creative director you're an animator whatever if you if you already like know the tools uh, learn like storytelling, cinema, cinematics, cinematography, but like story and cinematography, that's what I'm, the, the, the gap I'm trying to fill now because I was not trained on this. I have some experience and background, but like, so now, uh, yeah, I, I say, okay, I really know how to operate the tools. I have some like technical skills, but now I need to be stronger on script writing, on character and cinematography, lightning, cuts, all, this is cinema, it's pure cinema and yeah, so I think then you, get, then you have a great combo when you get some skills with the storytelling and then you can make these stories real fast and nicer with the tools. I think it's a killer combination. I think it's really interesting. And that's why, that's why creative ex previous creative experience, as for instance a film director or um, a photographer or whatever, some, something in the visual traits, is, is super valuable because you already possess those skills, right? And then either make your own like uh, make sure that your tooling skills are up there or uh, or team up with somebody like you guys or whatever who's very good at mastering the tools and then you have like this magic um a magic workflow that you can can make together and the output that you can make now with a small team as we have all discussed many times the, the output that you can make in the future with just small teams is going to be amazing so this the creative skills are still super valuable and they will it, it will never change and if for ai especially it is it is the the most valuable thing being able to create and have a vision and have a direction and know what you want to tell and be a storyteller. I mean, you're saying um, I need to amp up my storytelling skills out there, but you've written this beautiful story uh, already. So you you have great uh, storytelling skills. Perhaps you can make. Are you you are looking to amp up your perhaps your visual storytelling skills or your editing skills or whatever? But the storytelling is already there. That's why you had your movie the way it is and it, you already had it in your in your the back of your pocket because you already wrote it yeah th thank you talking about creative skills uh how how do you think ai will impact the job market like creative professionals more or or, or, or job that's it's broad so let's keep on the creative field and what which kind of new new jobs do you think will arise and which jobs gonna die well i think the processing jobs kind of jobs will perhaps uh, exist less so that for instance like retouching editing stuff like that it, it will still exist but it will be definitely um, a smaller trade so a lot AI can 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 do lots to uh, have like boost productivity there so I think there is going to be some cuts there uh, also goes for for instance for extras within movies or catalog models um, stuff like that and I think the the real va uh, valuable uh, thing is going to be the creative direction skills or the like the visionary skills or the the things that AI is not capable of AI is not very creative in itself so it needs somebody to take it by the hand and tell it what to do the ones who are able to take it by the hand and lead it to a great path or up a mountain to a, a great output those are the ones who are going to be very valuable um, I still think that there's going to be lots of creatives needed in the future. Uh, I do think that the roles are going to be a, a bit different and that we have more of a moderator kind of role within creation. So I think there's lots of more moderation uh, also on the, the output coming. It's like, is this good? Is this not good? Like selection, curation, selection, moderation, stuff like that is going to be more important. Um, so that's that's what that's what I believe. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. And, and on that note, 
uh, on more the brand side, because you, you are among other things a brand specialist, how you see the impact of AI in branding in, in like two, two points in the immediate sense, talking about what it, AI can do for brands now, like what it can accelerate in the process, what it can change. And in the future vision, what do you see AI doing for brands in terms of enabling new things, new solutions, uh, different innovative outcomes, maybe brands having conversations in real time, uh, online, like what, what kind of new things you think AI could bring to the, the brand game? Well, I think for instance, what I think is going to be very interesting when it comes to um, um, the brand output or the, 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 thing, the, the way brands are going to uh, interact with uh, their consumers is that uh, I think the, the role of avatars, brand avatars, brand sp spokespersons, digital synthetic humans, digital avatars is going to be um, something that might be very, very interesting, uh, an interesting development. So for instance, um, you will have like a real, feels like a real one-to-one -one conversation with uh, maybe the, um, uh, like the CEO of like this, this big brand or like this, this person who's very famous who works at the brand or somebody who's like a mascot for the brand and you, got, you can just like directly interact. So the, the brand becomes a personality when you do that. If you have like a, um, an avatar uh, that you're talking to and that avatar is, is, is going to move really natural, has very natural speech also, um, in real time can answer your questions. This is so valuable for brands because then they're like, people instantly have so, some sort of like emotional connection to that brand. So this is, this is a super big, uh, I think, chance and a, a big growth market too. So I, I guess that. And also, I also very believe in more immersive kind of um, brand experiences. So I think AI can also do a lot there. A immersive experience are naturally like the in the traditional way quite expensive to create and there's also there's not much usage yet in web 3 or like immersive environments but I think uh, making an immersive brand experience is going to be viable yeah very viable and very necessary in the future so and also for us as AI creators I think we're going to move much more towards 3d and immersive and yeah, maybe the, the like the films Odair is going to make is going to be more gamified, right? So it's going to be more of a gamification, and I I do really believe in that. Like the the, the chances that 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 come with uh, photorealism, authenticity, and photorealism within games is going to be major disruptive also within the, within the advertising world. So I don't know if you've seen like the footage from, you know, what that, I don't know. It wasn't Unreal Engine, it was like the motor game, but it's like super, super, it's something with 77. I'm not a gamer, I don't know, but it was super realistic, photorealistic, and it's like, it's, it's like walking within the real world, right? And what AI can do is it can generate your next step, right? It can generate 100 meters before you. Before that, you needed to have like this defined, sculpted environment and but in the future you will AI is just gonna think of okay she's now walking here let's build her a palace there because she likes palaces I'm going to walk to the palace then I can be a, a queen on my throne because I like that so much and then you know it's gonna be <laughs> adjusted Mauricio is gonna get a whole other experience than I uh, will have in the games I'm, That's I'm super looking forward for AI in games because I'm a gamer so I think it will be very very nice very also interesting to talk, I, I think the game yeah the, the worlds will be constructed in real time based on your choices on your game so it will create like missions custom missions and that, that were not programmed pre-programmed so and also the characters will speak things you know like this avatar so yeah i think it will be very weird <laughs> but cool and uh yes, i would mind to, to have a, a visit to the palace have a yeah a step my, my, VR. my toes on the shoes of a queen <laughs> yeah it would be nice <laughs> vr experience okay we're gonna see that in the future yeah. promise us show what show us but i when i but when i 
this Green Hacker project, when I had the idea, we also had this idea to have some VR experience and will be similar to this bubble that you have today in Las Vegas. So it will be this like dome, like a, like this uh, planetarium or something. And then some story will kind of like start to appear there and it will just like kind of be watching the story appearing like you've seen a vision on the sky or something like that. It was also like nice idea, which is still quite hard to execute, but I see getting more and more easy in some way to, to execute it uh, without a big team. Would be awesome but nice. that, that will probably be the pre-stage, right? Because that's sort of immersive and that's super valuable and a super, I guess, very impressive. But the, the, the real stage is gone, that you're going to be able to walk along the green hackers and see, you know, where they live that would and be cool. maybe even touch things, right? Or pick something Maybe the up big or... Hollywood cinemas will do that. Like they will launch a movie and then there will be this world which you experience, even like with Apple Vision Pro, right? It's kind of doable already. I do, so. I, I do really believe that that will be the future for Hollywood productions because I think the 2D experiences that we now You're have may limited, be a bit enhanced. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a bit of enhanced with IMAX and, and, and 4D experiences, but it's not like really 4D. So I think the immersive films of the few picture movies of the of the of the future are, are definitely going to be I, I, I believe that's the way Hollywood should go. I'm not sure if they all go there, but they should. They should. And or and or else somebody else was is going to do it and no, I think in the near I future think... you just put some something on on your like like small hat or something. And then it will like no invasive will connect with the electro signals of your brain. So while you're watching them you will be watching a movie on this VR but it, you will also be feeling the smells of the movie uh, and all these like other sensations that it would just that the cold on your on your brain like you will not feel anything. But you'll, if you're being like a water scene, you will feel the smell of the water of the place or something like that. I think this will, will be, be like a series doable. The three body problem uh, yeah. series. That's exactly Mix that they put the alien black mirror in, <laughs> and that, that exactly that's that's what's happening. So. Yeah, well, that's beautiful. your sci-fi side that yeah. you're now. Like, I like it. I, I want more. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I, I think that 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 is at least much more promising than a Ray-Ban from Meta, right? So yeah. uh, I wouldn't, you know. Which I also I thought about buying, because there are some use cases which are no. I know that you say why well, I will not use it, but there are kind of some use cases that can be interesting. But for for my for my the most for me the most important is like record store. So imagine that you're, I'm going there checking records. So I just take the record and say, okay, how much does this cost in Amazon? Because it's what I do with my phone. I take my phone, then I need to search for the record to see if the price is right, for example. So this is something that I will do hands-free with the glasses, like really nicely to, I would just like, you know, I'm on the record store. I just take the, the record, the, oh, how much does it cost in Amazon? And then I will see if the price, okay, no, too expensive here. Or, oh no, it's a good price. So yeah, I think there are some interesting uh, cases for for the the, the glass. It's too heavy now. It's too heavy. Yeah, Terrible to run. I, I would, I would probably go to a liquor store and check wines like that. And yeah, but also like, anything you want, you can just take the wine. Hey, no, show me the review of this wine, and then he would just yeah, this wine, blah 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 blah. Because I now use my phone for that. Yeah, exactly. Like this kind of stuff. But can it, can the can the can that made made a glass Ray Ray Ban glass even be like uh, be sharpened to your eyesight? Because yeah, I yeah. mean, we're all like no, glass yeah, yeah. You can you can take the prescription. Yeah. The Apple the Apple Vision Pro as well. When you buy online, you need to upload your prescription, and they will send you with oh. the correction already. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's interesting. That's interesting. And, oh, I'd uh, still, I would never wear a Ray-Ban like that. It doesn't <laughs> suit me at all. But the wearables, I'm not so sure about the future of the wearables. I'm really... I, no, I think, think for, so. some, for some use cases, they are just better with our phones. So we will mix them. Like, I don't think our phones will go away sooner. They will not. The phones will stay here for a long time because you can do everything on the screen. There's also the privacy and voice and all these questions all these things. So they will stay here for a long time, but we more and more will get these uh, wearables uh, for many use cases, also for memories. Uh, uh, for example, there is now this new from Rewind, this other pin, the, not the AI pin, but there's yeah. some new from, from yeah. the Rewind. They changed the name now, or something like that, which is like super cheap. And, but yeah, for some use cases, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. And I, th I think we will blend, believe, but the phones will stay. I do believe, 
Yeah, I do believe in the wearables like that, but I don't really believe in the wearables that are also a fashion statement because fashion is very subjective, right? I don't like the same fashion as other people do. So you cannot standardize like the fashion sense. So nobody, it's, it's not like that everybody suddenly wants to wear a Ray-Ban because, you know, it's, it, that, that won't happen. I do believe in the pins though, and I do believe in smaller things and yeah, accessories. Yeah, for me, I want them to appear as less as possible. If I could put on my pocket, yeah. it would be even better. I don't want to right. put something on my t-shirt, you know, like the people no, think I'm a spy from FBI or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. Scoot, uh, but with the, the hair but it is, you are a spy when you wear that. Also, <laughs> when you wear that Ray, Ray-Ban, it's, it's, it's a spying device. You yeah. can just... You can just, you know, go about and just record everyone and nobody will notice. And it's, no, they, it's, there, it's, there's it's, a light that, that you need to have this light because of this problem of privacy, which was the, also really? the problem with Google Glass at the time, which was super futuristic. For me, this human AI pin is the same thing as the Google Glass. It's like, yeah, you already have the tech to build it, but it doesn't mean that people are prepared to use it. And also, it's still no, super it's slow, right. you know, but like, yeah, you have the tech, you can build it. It's like, it's, it's a very nice build and stuff, but... People are not prepared for that, and it's not not connects with your phone. There's a lot of flaws, but but I think it's a bit this thing a bit advanced for his time. So, yeah, not because it's well, doable. I, Steve Jobs was good on that. There was some technologies that they were already here, but of course he combined usually multiple. But like he kind of like put it in some way on a package, but also on the right time when he see that people are will like more able to use it in terms of like user experience and stuff. Yeah. And it should be right timing, right product and right timing. Yeah, right. The timing is super important, and it's also the case. It's not only at the, the timing, but also does it add value, right? Does it? Add, the, I mean, humane is is a nice gadget, but it doesn't really solve an essential problem. It's even it. It's not. It's even more difficult. You know, it it doesn't solve it. It it's, it goes the other way, and I think that's also. I think that's that's a that's a good parallel to AI creation. It 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 need if you're going to ask for an AI production, it needs to solve something, right? It it doesn't don't create a problem that's not there. You know, if like a product shot is much more capable of doing what you need, then just ask for a product shot and ask for a photographer. You know, that don't ask for AI when AI is not the right tool. That's that 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 might be a good advice because everybody just now wants to get in on that like they want all they want the rabbit right the device because everybody wants the rabbit and i want the rabbit too uh, buy the rabbit if it's if it's valuable but it's add value uh, to you uh, ask for ai tooling when you're or ai productions when um or synthetic media as we call it when it's when it's an addition to what you need and uh, not just for the for the sake of just having a synthetic production done because that everybody wants to get in on AI, AI productions right now and they just want to be able to say we've done an AI commercial or we've, we've done an AI, an AI shoot or in Syntagraph. Sometimes it just makes zero sense to do it like that and sometimes it makes a lot of sense and you just have to know when is, the right, is AI the right tool and when it, 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 it is not. Truly yeah. agree. Yeah, talking about uh, is the right tool. Do you think AI can truly generate, uh, create original ideas, or simply remixing data? I definitely think if you have the right prompt engineer there, or the right creative AI creative behind the wheel, that uh, right behind the steering wheel, that it's definitely able to create something truly creative. I mean, the the the, the problem is that everybody's saying what is true creation right because it's uh, every creative output has been inspired or de redefined by something else that has you know came before it um, but I do think and I, I I've seen lots of proof of that that AI is definitely capable of creating true creative outputs um, if you're going to um, uh, if you're going to replicate uh, by prompting in a replicating way, then the tool will give you a replication in the end. If you're going to be original about it and have a, an original uh, approach, then you can have an original output. It all depends on the, the one behind it. The tool is as creative as the one who is steering it. So I don't, 
I don't think that AI is any different in that sense than, for instance, 3D or CGI. I mean, you can be as creative as you want. You can also be very not creative or copy. Yeah, it's an instrument, like an instrument. Like it's you can play instrument. a Beatles song or you can play a, your own, you know. It, it's, it, it's just a choice of the person who is in command. I totally agree with you. And you're not just like creating this pool of these talented people that knows how to create with AI, but you're building a community around that for your AI agency. Uh, yes connecting creatives, pr providing support. Can you tell more about that and, and what are your plans for the future, for, for the future of AI agency and this community? Yeah, so what I think is really important is that, first of all, I just really love the AI community. I, just, I love, I love this, this, this new set of, of, of people I've, I've got, to, got to know, and I really love the, the mental um, approach, of also like the, the progressive part. Um, uh, people are very like friendly also, and are very open and very interested, curious. These are curious people. They, they just want, we are all driven by the same drives, right? We're curious, we're open, we're, you know, we just have the same kind of, uh, drives there. So I think that that's what I really love about the community. Um, what I also really love is that the, the fact that AI makes it, um, makes us, uh, or like, no, let me say it differently, digital creation, since virtual production makes it possible to create with this wide number of people who live anywhere in the world. So for us, that's super valuable, but the, the, the hard part is, how can you keep these people, make it like a cohesive group, create some sort of joint um, motivation or, you know, joint effort, make it a joint effort, team up those groups. Because lots of AI agencies are mostly representation agencies. So they have like this pool of AI creatives that they directly set through to, to brands. What we're doing is making teams, creating like a mix of workflows, a mix of talents, a mix of specialties. And for that, it's super essential that we are, you know, working as a collaborative um, organism. So for me, the community vibe is very important. And also because I really believe that um, uh, we can grow much further and much faster if we share knowledge, right? If we share our findings, there's so much to discover and there's so much to be found. And I love it that people in this community in general are really open source. And I think this really is, has to do with, um, that's definitely uh, the stable diffusion community or the Confuse, Confu the GitHub uh, you know the people. You know the ones, Mauricio. You know the ones I'm talking about. These open source guys that you know, they just love to share, and they they are not like own part of. They they are not like the old traditional way. Is I own this. This is my finding. I'm not I'm not gonna tell anybody else because that you know then everybody's going to copy copy me. Sure, that's a natural feeling. I think we all experience that. But I think the great thing is that people can move over, like step over that feeling and just say, okay, no, I'm going to share it because somebody else is going to share their workflow with me as well. So I'm going to learn from them as well. If I give something, I get something back. And I think that that sharing, that care, sharing is really caring. So this, it's a caring community. It's just a very nice community to be part of. So I'm, I, I really have never felt so uh, part of like this group of cohesive group of people with well we're not cohesive we're super different but we all have these same kind of drives and it really is fun to work with I really love it yeah so this is why we are building also this community of creatives that we want to you know slowly grow as we are growing and well we do that on discord since yesterday <laughs> Um, no, yeah, definitely. so we, I also we, see we, this openness on the community and sharing, and yeah, and also I think even like it's, it's again, it's just a tool, right? You can teach someone to use, like, I can teach someone all my film workflow, that's not a problem at all. Like, 
each one, each person will create a different film. Period. Like, it's the same. You give a camera, we go to the same room, we will make different photos, and they will not will not be the same. So it's not about the tool or yeah, I have this. I can generate this kind of image. Okay, like what are you gonna do with that? Or what's the same with the film? What's your story? What's the concept? Why are you doing this? What's the point? And etc. So. Yeah, I think I don't see any problem in sharing tools and workflows and stuff like that. But I really like so yeah, I learn a lot on the community. I also try to give back also with this project and with the stuff we do with Zero One. It's also because we are always also learning and, and learning with uh, people online as well all the time. And that's something yeah, nice about right. this industry. You're always learning, right? Something because move so fast and yeah, if you're curious, if you're a nerd, if you like computers, if you like it's really nice place because always changing, right? And I feel like the beginnings of the, the internet with like things were changing super fast and yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, it's definitely impossible to get bored within this uh, creative vibe that we're now experiencing. And I think lo lots of people within the community are people who get easily bored. And we're now like constantly running, running, running and doing new stuff. And it's, it's, it's super, yeah, that's really fun. And, and what you're saying, Odair, you're very right about that. I mean, the, the open source factor will result in somebody else using that same workflow that you're using or the same pipeline in a completely different way because we're all different people. So it will not end up being the same result. So sharing will not mean that we're going to copy. Sharing will only mean that we'll amplify the quality and the, and the level of output of the entire community. So I really do believe uh, that it, it's a very valuable uh, part of this community to be open source. Definitely. Yeah, it's not a competition, you know, it is a collaboration. Yeah. It has brands for everybody to work on. Look how many people there is in the world, how many things there is to do. It's, it's all about everybody helping each other, everybody grows. It's basic logic, you yes. know what I mean? Yeah. Definitely, because there is room for us all and there's 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 enough demand and there's there's enough there's there's a space for every creator and be it an ai creator or not but if you have a defi defined talent or a specialism there's there's going to be a place for you you have you'll always find that niche or that that well maybe it's going to be wider but you at least you'll find your niche of brands who are going to need your skills and i think you just have to do what you're very good at and that's probably also the thing that you really like to do. So that'll be my main advice. Try to try to chase the things you really love. And if you do that, you'll be you'll be stand out. You then then you'll stand out from the from the rest, and you 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 stand out from the crowd. And that, that follow your follow your heart in in this creative journey, AI journey. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we are we are reaching the end of the conversation, so we have two more questions for you. Uh, yeah, th thanks for for being here with us for your, all your insights. So I would like to my last question is about uh, the human touch. So, in a world driven by AI, uh, what do you think like unique human qualities will remain essential for like success in the creative industry? Well, I think it's creativity. I think that that that. It, this this is the most essential human skill, the soft skills, all the soft skills, right? Um, but creativity in particular, because we are all creative, so this is a creative community, um, this is going to be never, ever going to be replaced by AI. I really do not believe that. I mean, th um, this is such a unique trait that humans have, uh, and I believe that will that will remain valuable indefinitely. So that's definitely my view on it. Yeah, I'm with you on this for sure. I think what makes us humans it was, will be ever more and more required. So Chrissy, thank you very, very much for being here with us. It was an absolute pleasure. I think we touched such important points of the, the community, the AI, the requests for the clients and the misunderstanding there still is about the technology. Uh, we like to let the last question open to you to if you want to share anything about your career, your company or any tip you want to give to, to people watching, the mic is now yours. Well, hook me up if you're looking for a jo job. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you I mean, I just uh, no, I just I would I would just like to at, um, 
also advise not to fear, especially the ones who come from the traditional side. I think, I think what I really want to give as a final message is that we are, a, as a creative community, we should remain one creative community. We shouldn't be divided in the pro-AI uh, creatives and the, the naysayers. Um, there's lots of, um, there's a bit of a cold war going on between those two and it's, I think it, it's such a shame, right? I think we're all, we all started being a creative because we essentially just really love to create. We're essentially just sensitive, probably very open, empathetic beings that just really like to create something, right? And um, it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's going to help us as a creative community community to be opposed on all different sides. So I, I think the, my message to the AI community would be be a little empathetic with the ones who are now on the, on the brink of losing their job of, or, or feeling like they're going to lose the, their job, which is, this is, this is rough, right? If you, if you have been a 3D artist and you have been a 3D artist, like specializing for 20 years in sculpting or whatever, or rigging or whatever you did, right? Which is super difficult, uh, character design, stuff like that. And now you finally find that something else might be able to do your job, like in an instant. That's, I mean, that's, that's really tough. That's, that's tough news, right? You have to be, that's a bit of a mourning that you have to go through. This is a mourning process and people are, are have the right to go through that mourning process. So even though we feel differently because it, it gives us such joy and it's also su such an enabler for us, the, the, there is a part of the community who's really struggling with this and it's, it's rightfully struggling with this. So I think that that would be my advice to the AI community because I don't believe the naysayers will hear this. So I, the, the, I'm going to give the advice to the AI community to ask for like more empathetic views because we don't want to create a war within a creative community. We all, we all should love each other because it's, it's, it's just a, a nice community, right? If we're all, I, get, I really believe that we're all nice. So peace, peace to all. This is my final message. <laughs> great, great, I love it, love it. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Uh, Odair, you like to say some final words? No, yeah, so thank you for, for coming, thanks for our time. We know that life is busy, and yeah, thank, thank you for, for your work as well, and also creating this awareness on the market and all of this. And yeah, it was, was, was a pleasure, I think we spoke about a lot of different things, and yeah, like I said, it's always good to stop and talk about, and even like, we talk about too many things, but still, right, we could go even deeper and deeper, we're still, still scratching the surface in some way. But it's better than 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 nothing. So these this conversations are also nice for us to understand uh, ourselves and what's happening. So yeah, and we always finish with some quote from some inspiring quote to make people think when they press stop when the episode ends. So Mauricio has a, a quote for us. And yeah, thank you very much, Iwao, and see you next time. Thank you very much, Chris. It was an absolute pleasure. And yeah, thank yeah. you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. Thanks very much. Love your peace message. Uh, so the, the quote for today is from Ellen Frankenhaller, and it says, the only rule is that there are no rules. Anything is possible. It's all about risks, deliberate risks. Thank you very much.